I'll now talk about the paper Compact Privacy Protocols from Post-Quantum and Time Classical Assumptions. It's a paper that appeared at PQ Crypto 2020, and it's joint work with Jonathan Boodle, Anya Lehman, and Gregor Zeiler. The goal of this line of research is to construct succinct zero-knowledge proofs for various statements. So this is a very active area of research, and there have been many constructions based on classical assumptions, so like factoring, discrete log, or some of the variations. And these constructions have names like bulletproof, sonic, supersonic, and there's really many others. And what they have in common is that their outputs, the proof sizes, are very short, uh, sometimes even just a few kilobytes, for arbitrarily long statements. They, these proofs are really succinct. Asymptotically, they're about logarithmic in the statement length. And um, there's also been some recent constructions where the security relies just on the collision resistance of hash functions, arbitrary hash functions. So uh, these schemes are actually um, advantageous over the ones above if you care about uh, quantum security. So if, because you know, arbitrary hash functions are quantum secure. So these schemes like Aurora and Ligera are also succinct with Aurora also being logarithmic in the, um, in the length of the uh, statement. But uh, kind of uh, what these proofs, um, kind of the, one of their negatives is that they have a s large startup cost. So that maybe it's uh, a few hundred kilobytes, uh, you know, is the minimum. Uh, but, but after that, the, the sort of the added factor is sublinear. But there is that hundred kilobytes startup cost. So for some statements, we would try to do a little better. Um, so some middle ground uh, that can be considered is the following. So let's say you have a zero knowledge proof system that has post quantum security privacy and privacy, but only classical soundness. Um, so what uh, this the advantage of this scheme is that you can use them now and stop using the quantum era. But because you have this post quantum privacy, the main worry that quantum computers cause to classical crypto is gone. And this main worry is that um, this this harvest and decrypt attack basically people are concerned that even though there are no quantum computers now somebody could be harvesting their transmissions and then waiting for a quantum computer to appear before decrypting but if your scheme is post quantum secure you basically have privacy forever so these harvest and decrypt attacks are not a worry and uh, uh, because you have classical soundness you can keep using the scheme um, you know before quantum computers are built so you will have soundness in the classical era and we don't know how long that era will last but you know until it and until it's finished uh, it, it's it's okay the scheme is okay and so this this already was considered we considered this in 2014 um but but here you know we, we try to ask for a little bit more so instead of just classical soundness uh we would like to have something that's sometimes called quantum annoying it has other names um soundness and uh, what this means is the following, that every time you want to uh, forge a proof, you have to break a fresh instance of a classically hard problem. So it's, uh, you know, if you just, if we just ask for classical soundness, somebody with a quantum computer could just come along, solve some perhaps discrete log problem. And then once he solves that problem, he can forge as many proofs as he wants. But with the quantum annoying um, requirement, you have to say no, no. That you know, that you cannot just pre-process with a quantum computer. You have to use a quantum computer every time you want to forge a proof. So um, this, you know, in some scenarios, this could be very expensive because maybe it's not, you know, the proof is not used in a scenario where uh, it's it's worthwhile to use a quantum computer. Maybe using a quantum computer is quite uh, quite expensive. Even in the future, it'll probably be a very expensive or ordeal to use a quantum computer. Um, so this, um, this 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 notion is useful. It has the same sort of advantages as the previous one, with the added advantage that even in the quantum era, it could be useful because it still requires you to use a quantum computer every time you want to forge a proof. Um, now uh, you can add something to it and say, well, now not only um, do you have to solve a fresh instance every time, we're going to force the prover to finish in a, in a certain amount of time. So we say, look, an honest prover can probably do this very fast. So now we're going to require that you give me the answer, give me the proof in two seconds. 
And now it's quite possible that uh, even if quantum computers can break factoring the discrete log, it'll take them a lot longer than two seconds to do it. So in, in a way, this is another um, you know, reason that this scheme could be useful even in the quantum era. So we're going to try to design these proofs for a very special uh, class of statements. And these are statements that are very useful for uh, constructing lattice based schemes. So these are polynomial relations. Let's consider the standard lattice ring, this ring zqx mod x to the n plus 1. And uh, a typical lattice relation it involves um, public polynomials a and t that everyone knows. And the secret polynomials are S and E with small coefficients that satisfy A S plus E equals T. So you can think of it as a basic ring algebra E equation or a ring cis equation. Um, basically, these, these come up all the time in lattices. So if we have efficient proofs for these, maybe we can construct some nice protocols um, that have uh, post-quantum privacy based on lattices, but maybe uh, soundness or the proofs we will do based on discrete log. So we've considered doing this proof already uh, with uh, Rafael Del Pino, myself, and Gregor Zeiler in 2019. And the idea is as follows. If we rewrite this polynomial equation a s plus e equals t as a of x, just writing it formally, a of x times s of x plus e of x equals t of x over this ring, z q x matrix the n plus 1, we can also write this equation over without any modulus reduction, without modulo q modulo x to the n plus 1, just over the ring z of x. So that, that's simple, you just rewrite, um, rewrite it as a of x times s of x plus e of x, plus some multiple of q, which is y of x, plus some multiple of x to the n plus 1, which we call z of x. And now the idea is the following. We're going to prove that the above equation holds for a random challenge alpha. Okay? So basically, think of now think of those equations over z of x evaluated at some integer or element of zp star alpha. So we would just have a of alpha times s of alpha plus e of alpha, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is now just integers over zp, zp elements over zp star. And the interesting thing is, if you can prove this equivalence for a random alpha, the Schwarz-Zippel lemma implies that really the polynomial relation also holds, except with probability 1 over p. But p will be very large. Uh, and so, the, you know, so with high probability, this equation will hold. So now, let, to see how this proof is done, let's just rewrite it a little more. So now I'm just really just rewriting the above statement in term uh, as a vector, as an inner product of two vectors. So, in, so a of alpha times s of alpha is, you know, it's just uh, a of alpha. You see the a of alpha and s of alpha in these two vectors and uh, etc. Then there's a 1 times e of alpha and q times y of alpha and alpha to the n plus 1 times e of alpha. Um, so I just rewrote it as an um, inner product and one of these vectors is public and the other one is secret. So the secret vector can be rewritten further as um, a matrix vector product where the matrix consists of the coefficients of, the, uh, of, the, of this polynomial, of these polynomials, and the vector consists of the powers of alpha. So if you just look at this uh, matrix and the vector, you will see that their product is really the evaluation of S at alpha, E at alpha, Y at alpha, and Z at alpha, right? So if S0 is the, is the, co is the coefficient of the power of 0 of S, S1 is the coefficient of the power of X, S2 is going to be the coefficient of X squared, etc., then this is really, the, the, this matrix vector product is the evaluation at alpha. And now there's the, again, the, the, the same public vector that we had before. So really to prove that um, a, this, this equation evaluated at alpha in ZP star involves proving this uh, matrix vector uh, product, this vector matrix vector product. Okay, so that's that's what we are trying to prove. That's so here's the protocol that we considered. First, the first step that the prover does is it commits to all the secret information. So the S, the E, the Y, and the Z, and sends the commitment over to the verifier. The verifier then creates a random challenge alpha in this uh, new field ZP star and sends it to the prover. And then the prover needs wants to prove that uh, you know, the evaluation of that equation at alpha is, is correct. So he would like to create a proof that uh, this proof pi one that this uh, vector matrix vector equation does uh, work out. 
And the second proof that he has to send, which is also very important, is that the coefficients inside this matrix are small. So S and E have to be small for that, uh, for that lattice equation to make sense. You know, otherwise, this, it's not, not hard. The LW problem is not hard if S and E are not small. And then the second part is the Y and the Z. These are the multiples of Q and X, the N plus one. And the reason they have to be small is because this equation is mod P. Whereas the lattice equation that we want to solve, that we want to prove actually, is mod Q. So we don't want a, a reduction mod P to take place because if this equation holds mod P and there is some overflow mod P, it doesn't mean that it holds mod Q. So this equation really has to hold over the integers. Uh, so therefore Y and Z have to be small in, with respect to P. Then the um, prover sends these proofs over to the verifier and the verifier checks if they're correct. So uh, where does discrete log come in? Well, it comes in here uh, because we're going to do the proofs uh, of uh, the, the vector matrix vector product is correct and that the coefficients are small using discrete log proofs. So here's some notation. We're going to write uh, G. So G is uh, a bunch of uh, elements in, in, the, in the group um, that we're going to be doing discrete log over. Um, and uh, G to the S, where S is this matrix, just means uh, just take the... Um, coefficients, the integer coefficients s, e, and y, z sort of uh, in a row, and just use them in the exponents of the g's. So g to the s is g0 to s0, g1, s1, etc. Up to g4, n minus 1, z, n minus 1. And now you can do a Peterson commitment to s simply by having another base, so h, and another randomness r, and do h of r times g to the s, mod p. So that's the Peterson commitment to s. And now, if you have this Peterson commitment to s, now you can use all these discrete log proofs that prove relations in the exponent of Peterson commitment. So for example, bullet proofs um, can create proofs for various relationships. So for example, it can create, it can, so it can in particular create, prove knowledge of that uh, vector matrix vector product, which is just a linear product. And it can also prove that, um, that um, you know, the coefficients of S, E, and Z are small and Y are small. And the nice thing is, even though it's a discrete log based proof, the, it is statistical zero knowledge. So it leaks no information, it statistically leaks no information about the secrets. And also, if you look at the Peterson commitment, it's also completely statistically zero knowledge because of this H to the R term. So privacy is information theoretic. Of course, if somebody can break discrete log, they can forge a proof. So here's the protocol from the previous slide. Um, and now you can sort of fill in what the commitment and the, how the commitments and the proofs are done. So the commitments are done using a Peterson commitment uh, with base HG. And the proof is done with bullet proofs. So pi 1, which proves the vector matrix vector product, and pi 2, which proves that the coefficients of the secret are small, is done using bullet proofs. So, of course, since it's done using bullet proofs, a discrete log based proof, if you can break discrete log, the commitment is not binding. So, I mean, it has nothing to do with bullet proofs, really. It's because we have a Peterson commitment. Um, so, if you can break discrete log, you, that commitment can be to anything you want. So, it's, so, the statement you're proving is basically meaningless. But, of course, you still have statistical zero knowledge. So, even if somebody can break discrete log, um, they can, you know, they can fake Peterson commitments. They cannot recover what was in your Peterson commitment. Right, so because it is information theoretically hiding. So something to note is that the previous protocol was, you know, it satisfied the property that its um, uh, its privacy is uh, post quantum, where the soundness is classical, but it was not quantum annoying. Basically, if somebody could break discrete log, they can forge the Peterson commitment to be whatever they want, and then do as many proofs as many fake proofs as they'd like. But in order, so in order to make it timed a quantum annoying, so let's just say quantum annoying, um, what we can do is make the verifier send a random H and G for which the prover will have to solve discrete log for, for which, which the prover will have to use for the Peterson commitment. So um, the, the idea is that the verifier sends a, a random seed that expands to H and G, like something like shake maybe, um, to make sure that H and G really are random, so he's, there's no trap door planted that helps him uh, helps him recover um, the secret. Um, <clears throat> and um, in that sense, 
the, the prover now cannot just use a quantum computer once to solve discrete log for an H and G of you know the, the fixed H and G. The H and G changes with the proof. Every time he wants to do a proof, he, he gets a new H and G. So what this means is that if discrete log is broken for this H and G, the commitment is not binding, but it's a different H and G every time. So this makes it quantum annoying. And the proof still has statistical zero knowledge, meaning that you know, the secret is still information theoretically hidden. So now, how does this protocol compare with what is currently known uh, without using this quantum annoying feature, just a lattice based protocol for proving knowledge of S and D? So the best current solution is by Eskin et al. at this Asia Crypt, and in the proof size for standard LWE parameters of you know, dimension about a thousand, a degree about a thousand, the proof size is 40 kilobytes. Um, the proof is not succinct, so it's it's 40 kilobytes for this uh, you know for this particular parameter set, but it uh, grows linearly in the size of the proof in the size of the uh, dimension of the lattice. But it's very fast. On the other hand, uh, if you do it uh, the proof, if you do the proof that I uh, showed in the previous slide, it's actually it's much shorter. It's only you know a little bigger than a kilobyte. And that really is because bulletproofs produces very short proofs, and it's asymptotically order of log n in the dimension of the of the of the ring. Um, but it has there's a bit of a there's a bit of a downside is that there's a lot of exponentiation required in the in these bulletproofs for kind of relating these lattice equations with uh, with um, equations in the exponent of a Peterson commitment. And so it takes, uh, you know, uh, very liberally about, you know, more than 10 seconds on a normal PC. So it's actually quite slow, especially if you compare it to the milliseconds of a purely lattice-based proof. But still, it has some, uh, you know, there's definitely some advantage in the, the fact that the proof is very short. In this paper, we'd like to extend the previous idea to see if we can construct some more interesting uh, privacy-based primitives. And kind of the next step, the simplest one, is a group signature. So it's very simple. Lots of people try to construct it because, um, you know, it's kind of a good guinea pig for testing out ideas. It has a zero-knowledge proof. It has some encryption. So if you can do this, you can do a group signature. You, it means you really have some techniques that you can then go ahead and use on some primitives that you perhaps actually do care about. But, uh, you know, constructing a group signature does show that, you know, that, that some technique that you have invented some new technique that could be useful elsewhere. Um, so a group signature has an authority who has a master public key and gives out user secret keys to group members. And then there are group members who want to sign messages, but they also don't want anything about themselves to be deduced uh, from the signature, except, you know, that he's a member of the group. So from the signature, you cannot tell which member of the group signed the message, except there's this uh, entity called the group manager who can figure out um, who signed the message. So he, you know, the, the rationale is in case of some misbehavior, the group manager can say, ah, you know, it was you who was misbehaving. So I mean, you know, he's punished in some way, maybe kicked out of the group or something like that. But he can tell which messages are uh, sort of being signed by, by which group member. So a simple construction of group signatures is as follows. Um, so here's an, there's an authority in key generation. Um, uh, so here's how it's done based on lattices. So the authority has an entry polynomial H, just a random looking polynomial in the ring. And his that's his public key. And his secret key are the two polynomials F and G, such that F over G equals H. And these polynomials can get extended to an entry trapdoor. Uh, there's also a group manager public secret key, which is just the public secret key of an encryption scheme. So since we're using entry there anyway, we can use another entry uh, entry polynomial and, and you know, and small entry polynomials, some f prime g prime, um, that are the secret key for the uh, group manager for the encryption scheme that he's using. Um, so now the um, group member y, if he would like a secret key generation, he goes to the authority, and uh, the and you know he gives his id y, and the authority calculate computes hash of y, where hash is some random oracle, computes uh, hash of y and finds its pre image. S and E, small s and E, so that HS plus C equals H of Y. Uh, so this is the, the way that you create the secret key for a group member uh, whose ID is Y. And the, the authority can do that because he has this trapdoor for H, F, and G, which 
gets extended to a, to a full trap door that allows them to do this uh, sampling. So then a signature is created as follows. Um, so the, the group member Y, he has S and E, so that HS plus E equals H of Y. And then he also creates an encryption of Y, which is C. So this encryption of Y is done so that um, the group manager can open, can link um, the ID Y to the, to the signature. Um, and then he gives a um, proof that he knows S, E, Y, and S, E, and Y that satisfy these two equations. And this is a fiat Shamir proof where the message is used in the challenge. Okay, it's sort of a it's very standard technique. The only thing somewhat different here is that we're using a hash function. We're using a random oracle, and we're going to be doing proofs with, you know, with respect to this random oracle, which is not cheap in general. So the proof, this proof, let's just look at the proof for H S plus C equals H of Y is done in two steps. So the the other part is is done very similarly. Uh, so first we set z equals h of y, we compute uh, h of y, and then you can prove knowledge of s, e, y, and z so that a, s plus e equals z and h of y equals z. Right, so it's, um, it's done in basically two steps for the same z. Um, and the way you do it is really you commit to z and output the commitment, and then you prove knowledge of s and b so that a, s plus c is an opening to this commitment, and then you prove a knowledge of y so that h of y is an opening to this commitment. That's the that's how you do it. So they basically you, you just use the techniques for either proving uh, pre-images of, of random oracles or the uh, you know the equation that uh, that lattice equation that we described a few slides earlier for the proof technique, and you can use that um, to prove this this you know more complicated uh, statement. So. The main added inefficiency of this protocol versus the one that just proved A S plus C equals T is that now this one involves a lot of commitments and compound statements that requires uh, you to sort of run basic copies of that previous protocol, but a lot of them. And also uh, there's a random oracle involved, which is a very non-algebraic function. So proving knowledge of a Y so that H of Y equals Z is more complicated in general, more expensive. And kind of what uh, makes it even worse is that H, this random oracle, needs to map into the ring. So not just a 256-bit output of a hash function, but a kind of a ring or maybe a subset of a ring, but, but certainly a lot larger than 256 bits, and that's fairly slow. So the, um, you know, and even if that's, even if we use a bulletproof friendly hash function like MIMC, still a pretty expensive operation. So the, the consequence is that the group signature size are small about 20 kilobytes so it's a fairly small group signature probably the smallest one uh, based on lattices uh, but the downside is that the signing time which we estimated was about 90 minutes so this is definitely not good and uh, certainly prevents the scheme from being used Um, still, I think that the line of research could be useful if somebody can improve on this uh, timing, uh, this this uh, long running time issue, because uh, this notion of time to quantum annoying is quite useful in the classical era, especially if you don't believe the quantum era is coming very soon. And uh, even if the quantum era does come, the, this timed assumption um, could it still be useful if, if you're not protecting, you know, if these proofs are not proving something very valuable. Right, so perhaps uh, using a quantum computer every time will will be you know not worth it for the adversary. Um, so, but still, really, I think I would say the, these proofs could find application if you could make them faster. So one idea is well, perhaps don't use bullet proofs for the discrete log proofs. Use one of the other ones. Uh, we did not explore this uh, this area. I mean, and a lot of other proofs have have appeared since this since we submitted the paper. So. Perhaps, uh, perhaps one of them is more compatible with what we're trying to do. Uh, another, I think, a very interesting um, a direction is to use a, a different quantum save assumption, maybe something code-based, a multivariate, and maybe that produces smaller discrete log-based proofs uh, that need to be proven. And that, uh, that, I mean, that is the main bottleneck. The the size of the proofs that we produce, the kind of the discrete log equation that we produce, results, you know, in a very in the proof time is very long for it because the discrete log uh, statement is quite long. 
but maybe using a different assumption produces smaller statements. But then, you know, we're not experts, so we, we, we haven't explored this direction, but I think it's very interesting. So thank you, and uh, that's it for the talk.